Watch this. You can find a lot of acronyms around the Treasure Valley. Compass, Jump, Bodo, ACHD. What about the CCDC? Ever wonder what they are and what they do? Well, one of you did, so today we're finding out. There are a lot of important points in the world. The point of entry, the point of a pencil, the point of this sentence. Idaho has a point too, and it all began at the initial point. Idaho Steelheads are heading into the postseason for the first time in three years. We're going to check in with the team to see how they're feeling before their first big game. You tried driving through downtown Boise recently, in which case you probably had to take a detour or two. Of course, in a growing city, construction, development is pretty much inevitable, something we touched on earlier this week when we were talking about all the traffic issues and the cones and the lack of street parking impacting downtown Boise businesses. Well, these projects are overseen by the Capital City Development Corporation, which sparked this viewer question. Hey, could you provide an explanation of the role that Capital City Development Corporation has in Boise and what its relationship is to Boise government? That's sent in from Bill, which is now a good time to bring in Andrew Bartline, who's been digging into this today. So exactly what is the CCDC, Andrew? Well, in the simplest terms, it's a renewal agency, and they do that through looking at a couple of different districts. We'll get into that in a moment. But it was created by the city of Boise for the city of Boise, and it was nearly 60 years ago. It really focused on economic development, which in turn looks like construction and projects in very specific parts of town. If the sights and sounds are already hanging over your head, just know it's going to be some time till CCDC projects pass through the neighborhood. The Urban Renewal Agency oversees six specific districts. Earlier this week, we introduced you to Westside and the negative impacts the 11th Street rebuild is having on local businesses. When there's like big equipment going, the building's shaking. Um, and this is our first year to date through April now, about the first quarter, that we're posting a year to date loss versus last year. While the West Side District's projects are expected to wrap up in 2026, five other districts are in the works too. That includes Old Boise, 30th Street, Shoreline, Gateway, and State Street. And these renewal plans can take up to 20 years, meaning the end dates can be decades away. The city of Boise founded CCDC in 1965 behind Idaho's Local Economic Development Act. The act was created to quote, encourage private investment in urban areas in competitively disadvantaged border community areas. That's also how the agency is funded, or at least part of it. CCDC operates under tax increment financing. They say TIF is a funding system used in 49 states. In theory, the development can pay for itself. As property values increase with investment projects, property tax revenue increases too. Park BOI parking garages and grants also fund the agency's bottom line, which is why if you've ever gotten a charge from CCDC on your credit card, it's because they own the parking garage you parked in. CCDC is a public agency, but they're independent from the city and the state. They are regulated by specific state statutes under the same Local Economic Development Act that led to their founding. And by nature of their work, CCDC holds a close relationship with the city of Boise. That's made even more clear by their board, where the Boise mayor appoints commissioners who are officially confirmed by the city council. And based on monthly meeting minutes available online, an individual commissioner has casted a no vote only four times since August 10th, 2020. So long story short, CCDC is not directly part of the city of Boise government, but it is heavily influenced by that city government. The agency says they're responsible for preparing the overall plans of each of those renewal districts. That includes both private and public projects. And admittedly too, Brian, I'm glad we got asked this question yeah. because I've wondered this since I moved here a couple years ago. So it was a little bit uh, educational for me as well. And what you said, what I also found interesting, that no vote, only four times in the last three years. I mean, that's basically saying, yes, we want to go ahead with all of these projects that are brought before us. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, they're in charge of the planning, right? right? So if they're giving all the green lights and preparing these plans for it, then yeah, it gives them the green light to go ahead and move ahead quickly, I would imagine. And when we talked with these business owners as well earlier this week, that was one of the things that really upset them is all of this at once. They're a little frustrated about that. Of course, it's an ongoing conversation. Trying to get in touch with CCDC. Did talk to them on the phone today. 
we're going to get some more information down the road on that. So with all that stuff going on downtown, you can either blame or thank the CCDC. We'll see what happens. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Another viewer question we got about COVID is, you know, something we used to kind of tally on and then report every pretty much every day. Numbers, though, thankfully, have been low enough. It hasn't been brought up for a while, but one of our viewers, another bill, asked this. Where is COVID still a factor in uh, Ada, I believe, uh, Idaho, I should say that. That's an old hyphenation of Idaho, by the way. Locally, Boise Eagle Meridian, they want to know that. Is there a vaccine pending as an annual shot to get? In other words, is this something we're going to have to see on a yearly basis, kind of like the flu? By now, a lot of effectiveness for prior inoculations has weakened and not as effective. We want an update. Well, Bill and Cole, according to the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, right now in Idaho, there are 396 new cases since the 14th. And they say there are only four cases today. That would be the 19th. There's a decline from earlier this month when there were obviously 185 cases on March 1st. Ada County is at a 3.2 incident rate across the daily seven-day moving average. That's per 100,000 people. Definitely a lower incident rate than we were seeing in the crux in the heat of the pandemic. So Idaho's doing pretty well right now. CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices met. They did meet today and they sent out relaxed COVID vaccine recommendations. It says there's an additional updated vaccine dose for those above 65 years of age and those immunocompromised. They also said the original COVID-19 mRNA vaccine won't be recommended in the United States anymore. People ages six and older should get an updated bivalent mRNA vaccine, regardless if they got that previous one. Multiple doses continue to be recommended for those young kids, and they said they will continue to monitor COVID-19 for additional changes to recommendations coming up this fall. So right now, no, there isn't an annual COVID-19 vaccine, but that could change, so stay tuned. All right, speaking of viruses, what if I told you there's a new virus out there and it's been discovered first here in Idaho? It has the potential to ruin one of our state's biggest crops. This virus was discovered by University of Idaho plant virologist, which is a real thing, by the way. Alexander Karazev found what he's calling the Snake River virus because, well, it was found near the Snake River near Rupert a few years ago in a field used to grow alfalfa. Karasev says he found the new virus after some testing, after testing some discolored hay, and he believes the virus is spreading by thrips, these little cigar-shaped wing bugs, which use those wings to bounce from plant to plant, and they suck out the insides of the plant and therefore spread the viruses. He said found this virus in 2020, so why are we just hearing about it now? Well, Karasev had to figure it all out, and he used a $300,000 grant to do that. And then, like all scientists, again, then write it up. Karasev published his findings in June of 2022, and what he found could be a problem for the area's cattle and dairy industry. The virus can reduce the yield and quality of the alfalfa, which is one of the Idaho's most widely grown crops, which is second only to wheat. But Karasev also admits it's one of the least studied crops we have. He hopes by doing more of that, the studying part, by studying this plant and this disease, well, then we can manage this new virus. Others as well that may pop up. So the whole point is we don't lose that quality and economic efficiency of alfalfa in Idaho. There's a point of history that still exists in Idaho today, a point where you can actually go stand on and look at. We're going to explain why initial point is where it is in southwestern Idaho. Uh, this is the time for you to tell us what you think. We want to hear your questions, your comments, and your concerns. And you can just text them to us, the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Don't forget your name and the hashtag, the 208. That way we can try to share yours at the end of the show. Oh, and keep them clean and concise. Clever helps.
Okay, so if you're familiar with the term Mason-Dixon line, then you might have some background to the significance of this next story. The Mason-Dixon line, these days known as the figurative political and social divide between America's northern and southern states, was originally the border between Pennsylvania and Maryland. It was created by two Englishmen, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, to legally separate the disputed territory of the Pens to the north and the Calverts to the south. They did it by surveying the land over a four-year stretch, something they finished in 1768. Well, that started a trend, and by 1785, the U.S. set up a survey system so they could sell off sections of land to pay off debts like those from the Revolutionary War. From the point of beginning between Ohio and Pennsylvania, that system spread west with the acquiring of more land. Each territory had to figure out their own starting point, though. Idaho's was figured out on this day 156 years ago. There are countless moments in history, points in time, where one can point from where everything evolved. For Idaho, that point is set in stone in the southwestern part of the state, known as the initial point. So the initial point is the place on the map where the principal meridian and the baseline meet. The principal meridian, the main line going north and south, and the baseline goes east and west. Terms that may not matter much to you, but they are critical to the public land survey system. Which is how all of the land in the American West uh, was divided and cut up and then made available from 1785 uh, through most of the 20th century. Here's the cliff notes. The land ordinance of 1785 set this survey strategy in motion as a moneymaker for the federal government. Points were picked and the land was laid out in 160 acre plots as the United States spread westward. Nearly a century later, it was Idaho Territory's turn. So President Andrew Johnson appointed Lafayette Cartier as Idaho's first general surveyor in 1866. And the very first step in that process was establishing the initial point. The instructions given by the General Land Office, it had to be a high spot or at the confluence of two streams. Cartier went high and chose this volcanic bump 20 miles outside of Boise. And it was established on April 19th, 1867. That wasn't the only significance of this spot. So the principal meridian had to radiate north to cover the entire panhandle, and the baseline had to radiate east and west to encompass the entire southern portion of the territory. Any survey that happened across the territory of Idaho would radiate out from that point on the landscape. Seems simple enough until you realize how they did it. They literally were working with chains and links, and they were literally out on the landscape walking with these chains. Imagine walking a straight line, measuring around mountains and into canyons and across rivers, 66 feet at a time. Wow, how long did that take? Decades. There were sections of the state that were still being surveyed and resurveyed well into the late 20th century. Whether it's on a map or in person, you can actually see how it all lays out from initial point. Anyone lives on or is familiar with Meridian Road, that is the principal meridian in the state of Idaho. Is that why it's called Meridian? Correct. Was it perfectly plotted? Not always. During a dedication of initial point for Idaho's territorial centennial celebration in 1963, organizers pointed out that wasn't on purpose. Let's be tolerant of these old boys who did the pioneer work for us. I do not say that there are no fraudulent surveys, but generally, we find that the errors are honest mistakes made by honest men. Idaho is especially fortunate in this regard because few of her surveys were made by this method. But she was made from this point, the importance of which should be anything but blunted. Because without that moment in time, we wouldn't have homesteads, we wouldn't have had, you know, the mining claims. That set in motion the development of the territory, which of course set in motion the economic development, the arrival of people of different cultures and ethnicities and experiences and backgrounds, which made this, this territory and then later the state what it is today. There it goes. That viewing platform for Initial Point was first built in 1962, but it has been vandalized significantly several times over the years. The brass marker has been spray painted, shot up, straight up stolen. One out there now has luckily been there in place since 2008, just set in concrete. Lafayette Cartier and his brother-in-law, Peter Bell, they first surveyed the
the southwestern part of the state from initial point there down in well southern of southern part of the state to the southern border and then they went from Oregon to just east of Boise so they got that out of the way but after that surveyors then went north into the panhandle because well they needed to figure out mining and timber territories because that was well people are starting to harvest that by the way Idaho and Montana are the only two western states with their own initial points and the only initial points in the state. Well, it's a little bit of rinse and repeat as far as the weather goes today. We're seeing those scattered showers once again today. This is the view over in Boise and three other spots across the southern part of the state. You can see some of those showers and lots of clouds in all of those areas. And we're actually tracking some of those storms right now. You can see they've popped up as the heat has built in the afternoon and we're tracking some stronger showers as well. One of those lines of storms moved through eastern Oregon, bringing some lightning and likely some hail along with that. And that's going to continue to move east. So visit Visibility is going to be impacted within the next hour or two areas east of there. Also, there's that part of the extension of that line that's moving towards Boise right now. It's currently in Nampa, but no lightning expected with, with that spotted with that one as of right now. But we'll keep an eye on it as we go throughout the next hour or so. So as we go into the evening tonight, temperatures are going to be a little bit on more on the mild side compared to what we saw yesterday. Yesterday was a bit cooler. We'll continue tracking the showers. All the way through the evening, we'll be seeing those scattered conditions continue, and we're expecting slightly warmer temperatures as we go throughout the evening tonight. Moisture will be tapering off for Thursday, but makes a return on Friday for Treasure Valley spots before we start to see things warm up just a little bit in time for the weekend. All right, well, there's something special brewing in downtown Boise, not all the breweries, obviously, but there's a run at championship glory, possibly. For the first time in three years, the Idaho Steelheads are hosting a playoff game, and that's happening tonight with the puck dropping in less than two hours. The 2023 edition of the Steelheads, actually one of the greatest hockey teams in regular season history, league history. Regular season, though, that's one thing. Playoff hockey, a whole different animal. Joe Paris 
Got the pulse of the team ahead of the puck drop. The Idaho Steelheads played the best regular season in ECHL history. That's now just a fact. And it was a dramatic end in Rapid City. He fires! He scores! Regular season champions is fantastic, but it goes without saying. It's not the ultimate goal for the Idaho Steelheads. They kick off that goal tonight, game one of the ECHL playoffs. Recently named Coach of the Year, Everett Sheen explains the balance of regular season success heading into postseason play. You don't rely on it by any means, stretch your imagination, but you, there's a lot of valuable learning lessons throughout the year. Um, you know, one goal games, comeback games, uh, essentially three playoff series, playing the team six times in a row. Uh, so you definitely look back and reflect and, and take those learning experiences. A best of seven playoff hockey series is a special intensity. Add the fact that Idaho hosts a very familiar team, or border rival in the Utah Grizzlies. Feeling excited, you know, we've seen Utah uh, quite a bit, 18 times, so we're quite familiar with them. Um, so it's more just looking after our details of our game and not necessarily having to do a deep dive on a team, um, seeing if they have any quirks or tendencies, because like I said, we've seen them quite a bit and just saw them a couple weeks ago, so we, we should be ready to go. Steelheads captain A.J. White knows Utah will be a test. It's a team that really challenged Idaho at home throughout the year. They have a lot of skill. They like to take their chances offensively, which is why we need to be smart and detailed in our defensive zone. And as long as we kind of make them play our game style and not try to play their game style, I think that's where we have our success. With a list of league records, ECHL season end awards, and the number one seed in the league, Idaho certainly has the attention of the hockey world. We, we kind of talked about that for uh, briefly this morning, and I think Coach Sheen said it the best. Um, he kind of said we've had a target on our back since early December when we went to Worcester, and they were the first place team in the league, and we swept them to become the first place team in the league, and we've been ever since. So uh, I think that's kind of our mindset. Uh, we know everybody's going to come in and give us their best every night, and that's kind of how it's been all year. Teams at this point of the year are pretty dialed. Like, it's going to be tough to score goals. It should be hard, heavy hitting hockey. And, you know, every game's competitive because each team's trying to just survive and, and get through to the next round. So it's just a little bit more on, more on the table. A major storyline in the Utah Idaho series is goaltending. Netminders Adam Scheel for Idaho and Trent Miner for Utah are set for a classic battle. We feel confident with whoever's in net, and uh, Adam Scheel has been incredible for us this year. Uh, especially I've, the last three months, has been arguably the best goalie in the league. I uh, probably could have been goalie of the month uh, every every month, and he was, I think, at least one of them. Uh, so Trent Miner's been good as well. He uh, he definitely finds a way to make that first save. So it's going to be crucial for us to make sure we get uh, a lot of pucks on that. And the puck drop tonight, 7-10 at the Idaho Central Arena in downtown Boise. I'll tell you this, if you don't have a ticket already, you are out of luck. It is a sold-out capacity crowd expected in downtown here tonight. Brian, the way the series will work, though, is they'll play tonight in Boise. They'll play on Friday night in Boise. And then they'll go to West Valley, Utah for a handful of games. So it's best of seven, first team to win four games. They advance to the next round. If for some reason this went to a game six or seven, those will be back home in Idaho. But uh, they're expecting a full building tonight. It should be a lot of excitement. Always is. All right, big fans there for the Steelies. Always at home. All right, thanks, Joe.
All right, welcome back to uh, last few final moments of the 208 here on this Wednesday. A lot of people had some comments about the initial point story we did, but this one probably the most interesting. Wonderful story about initial point. My great grandfather is Lafayette. Carte is how I said it, but she says it's actually pronounced Carte. I apologize for that. We were told it was Carte, but that's okay. Just a point of clarification, the Idaho Historical Museum doesn't remember that. I've lived with the family name Carte all my 90 years. Thanks so much. This is an amazing point that their granddaughter still around. The guy that laid out the entire or began laying out the entire state of Idaho. He died in 1891, by the way. So that's some legacy there in that family. Oregon has an initial point. It's near Portland. The initial point is located in Willamette Stone State Park, established in 1945, Skyline Drive in Portland. So a little bit later on. But you know what the thing is about that one is that initial point goes across two states. It covers Washington and Oregon. Like I mentioned, Idaho and Montana, the only ones that have their only initial point that just covers their respective state. Everyone else kind of spread out over several states. Or there are some spots that have like Native American reservations on there that have their own initial points inside those. FYI, just got over COVID, took home a test, did not report it to anyone. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there like that. You test, but not necessarily report. So we really don't know how many are getting it. That is correct, Jenny. The reporting numbers are way down. Uh, testing numbers are way down. We don't know exactly what's going on with COVID-19. How many variants are out there yet? Wastewater, though, still gives us an indication of what we can see in our area. CDC is doing great work, but there are times when I think it should be renamed the RCNLNC, Road Closures and Loud Noises Corporation. We'll see you tomorrow.